Hello, my name is Stephanie Dinkins. I'm excited to be bringing you this talk on the vernacular, craft, and community in artificial intelligence. I'm looking at these topics as I have come to know them through my art practice, which is looking at artificial intelligence through the lenses of race, aging, gender, and our future histories. I hope you enjoy what follows. Let me ask you a question. How do you know what you know? Most of my foundational knowledge comes from this woman, Bernice Curry. She's depicted here in her garden in Tottenville, Staten Island. The garden was a place that she used to make space for her black family in a mostly white community. Through this garden, she was able to bring people in and make them care about her and her family. And the way she worked her community and the way she worked the world that she created really set a foundation for the way I run my art practice to this day. The knowledge that departed with her when she died some years ago also made me think about what's being left behind and what's being lost and how I might be able to maintain some of that information for generations to come. The explorations that I do in AI have also made me think about what algorithmic systems know and how they know it. So I'm also asking the question, how do algorithmic systems know what they know? I've been trying to answer this question, or maybe I've been trying to provide alternatives to the way this question gets answered through my art practice. I'm gonna take you through a journey of some of my projects, starting at the one that I'm working on now called Not the Only One. Not the Only One is an experiment in creating a deep learning, voice interactive, artificially intelligent entity that tries to convey the multi-generational story of a black American family. In fact, it's trying to tell the story of my family. To make this piece, I've been doing oral histories with three generations of women through my, of my family. There's my Aunt Earlene, who's the matriarch of the project. She moved to Staten Island with her mother, Bernice, in the mid-40s um, from the South. So she is a direct descendant of the Great Migration. There's Sade. She is the youngest person in the project. She also grew up on Staten Island, as both my aunt and I did, um, and is a child of 9-11. And me, I'm the bridge between these two people. The way our data is derived is just sitting down and talking to each other. We've talked to each other in, in pairs and in triads. Um, and we use the tapes of the interviews as data to inform a deep learning chatbot. I'm trying to think of deep learning systems, algorithmic systems, machine learning as hosts and co-creators of living repositories for memories, written oral histories, myths, values, dreams of specific communities. And in this case, I'm really trying to think about that in relation to my own family. I've chosen my family as the subject of this project um, simply because I am not a computer scientist. I'm not an engineer. I'm becoming a better and better technologist, but I needed a topic that I was really drawn to, to help me enter and stick with this work. So my family is something I'm very much interested in. These ideas of holding on to ways of being in the world that I feel slipping away is also something that I want to hold on to and share. So they make a perfect kind of foil for my practice of trying to learn um, how to do machine learning and then using those machine learning processes 
to hold on to and archive um, information for small communities. So really what I'm saying is I'm trying to work with very small data in community and hold on to those community values and ethos by using deep learning natural language processing system. The result at this moment is a, a kind of odd sculpture um, that holds computers, speakers, um, algorithms, and um, text-to-speech systems, things like that, that people can walk up to and ask questions, and then hopefully not the only one will issue an answer that is, has some kind of logical relation to the question asked. I have to say that when I started this project, I thought I was going to be making something that would tell the family story in a very logical way. Someone ask a question such as, where's your family from? And it might say, oh, the family is from Tontville, Staten Island, or the family is from Wrightsville, Georgia. However, through the process of working with um, the algorithms, that we've been working with and trying to use small data, I found that I'm more making a system that has the values and the ethos of my family embedded in it, but is trying to come up with its own logics and ways of answering questions. And in a way I would say what it feels like I'm making is a fourth in a lineage. So not the only one becomes the fourth member of the lineage of people informing our family going into the future. It's been a really interesting journey. I'm gonna play you a quick little clip of what Not the Only One sounded like a few years back. Not the Only One, its data is housed on individual local computers and we're doing that to hold on to ideas of privacy, um, hold on to ideas of our data being ours and sovereign, and hold on to control of that data. Everything is local except for the voice that you will hear. The voice um, is now a Google Voice we're pulling down from the cloud. Um, over time, I hope to fix this to make a custom voice that will allow us to keep everything on local computers so that the whole system is local and under the direct control of the family and the computers that we hold in our own possession rather than cloud-based systems. So let's see if NTOO will talk to you a little bit. What is your name? What is your name? Yes, we were telling the right thing. And I got a little bitter I love. I don't understand the word you're saying. Talk to me. There are so many things I don't understand yet. Clearly. What this project really is, is a project of oral history, a project that looks at archives, and a project that looks at what the future of artificial intelligence looks like if it is contributed to by a multiplicity of peoples and stories, and if small data becomes viable within the spectrum of data being used in our algorithmic systems. So, and not the only one, I'm using oral history, um, really in-depth interviews, as particular nuanced databases based in love and care. I'm trying to preserve for future generations a sound portrait of who we are in the present and what we, what we remember about the past. I also hope that as this project goes on and develops, it's able to be a kind of touch point for future generations to understand the wisdom of their relatives directly. And here, oral history also becomes about memory and storytelling of acts of cultural preservation and social resistance. We are definitely, in particularly, inserting ourselves into a algorithmic historic record through this project, or at least I hope that's what is happening. Not the only one takes a few different forms. Um, this is a few 
um, people who are interacting with the piece. It's a different version of the piece. In this piece, we have a 3D printed um, gold version of the sculpture. It's really interesting in that people are very attracted to this much more kitschy 3D gold. And you'll hear me talking about the ways in which I'm trying to attract people to this project. Make it open to interaction in a very um, accessible way. Margaret Bowden in Creativity and Artificial Intelligence reminds us that creativity is a fundamental feature of human intelligence and a challenge for AI. Through this project, I'm trying to get beyond some of those challenges, make a space and an example and a model that people can see that these technologies are out there and available for them to interact with, yes, but even better for them to try to construct in their own image. I often tell people that this project truly is a project that has started in technologies that are available to everyone. I started making this through Dialogflow online, um, an online platform that lets anyone start to make speaking chatbots by putting in intents and answers. Um, then I moved on to GitHub, pulling down code that others have formulated, altering it, adding our specific database to it, and making it my own so that we have a system that senses people's presence, speaks with them in, in, in response to questions, um, but in particular uses our data. And I try to emphasize that these technologies are available to anyone who is willing to put in the time and effort to start to try to imbue natural language processing with ideas and cultural stances um, and information that they are truly interested in archiving, communicating with, and growing. That's a really important and essential part of this project. Um, I also tell people that it's not easy, and I myself have been learning as I go, so this project has been about me learning to do the code and then coding and altering, taking apart others' code to learn how to put it back together. I do work with others. I have a small studio of people who work with me to help with the code, um, to help with the objects, um, and to help move the project forward at different points, but it's often that we will go three steps forward and then I want to pull it back re-edit it, um, and make it even more my own. But this project is, is, a, is a project of, um, it's, a, it's a project of community where, where the people who are working on it are invested in the ideas of what it means to use vernacular information, vernacular technology, um, knowledge that we know um, and ways in that allow a broad spectrum of people to make or allow a broad spectrum of people to understand the idea that this is technology that they can create as well as consume. Um, you know, we're all working towards the same ends, and I think that shows in the process. Norbert Wiener once said, the world of the future will be an ever more demanding struggle against the limitations of our intelligence. I agree with this wholeheartedly. And part of my projects are to get people to start thinking about what it means to look at what our limitations are and have been and how we can make the future better by being very deliberate in the way that we bring new technologies into the world, not just using data from the past, thinking about what biases we bring to the algorithmic systems we're making, and, and finding ways to shift ideas that no longer serve us, um, biases and prejudices that have held us back into something better that serves the world in a better way and allows for more equity, um, more fairness, and a, a playing field that welcomes many, most perhaps.
This idea of the struggle against the limitations of our intelligence, the struggle against the biases that we have built into society, brought me to a project called Project al Khwarizmi. Project al Khwarizmi is an artist-led initiative that uses art and art making to help citizens, particularly communities of color, understand how algorithms, the artificially intelligent ecosystems they underpin, and big data impact our lives, and empowering them to do something about it. This project started explicitly with a concern for the local community that I come from. Um, these are communities of color. I wanted my neighbors and family members to think about and have a stake in the algorithmic systems that are increasingly making both consequential and inconsequential decisions that impact our lives. And what I'm talking about here is ideas of when algorithms decide who gets what kind of medical care and, and how much of it, or how long someone goes to prison and why. I wanted to think about how we start to shift algorithmic systems so that we are not only subject to them, but that we have a stake in making them and possibly to help change the way that communities of color interact with the systems um, that govern us, right? To make them better, to make them more fair, to make them more transparent, to make them more open. So Project al Khwarizmi, what this was, was a gallery space in downtown Brooklyn um, that welcomed anyone who was walking by to come in and talk, talk about the algorithmic future, um, artificial intelligence, and share their stories. We asked people passing by, what does artificial intelligence need from you? Right, and the idea here was to imply that yes, artificial intelligence is coming and that there is something it needs you to do. There's a certain amount that we understand about algorithmic systems, or there are myths that are propagated about algorithmic systems through the media, um, through entertainment, that tell us to fear it. And what I wanted to do was not say, instead of fearing these systems that are coming your way, what can you do to imbue them with the ideas and cultures and um, fairness that matter to you? So in this space, not only did we talk about these things, but then we made, we made practical applications. For example, using Google Voice Kits to make talking chatbots that held ideas and cultures that were attached to the people who came into the space. Um, we were really looking at code as practice craft Right, so not something that you have to learn from the math up, but something that you could start to dabble in and pull apart and learn so that you have more of an impetus to actually learn the math in the long run to, to make these systems better. And ancestral technologies. So saying that this is a technology that is a part of you, that is part of your trajectory, not something that is foreign or not for you. I've been likening this to ideas of craft and definitions of craft, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Project al Khwarizmi going forward and intersperse it with some definitions of craft that, I'm, that I've picked up from the um, American Craft Council. So, craft grows from everyday human experience, which makes it inherently social and political. It elevates the role that technique, method, materials, and community play in art making with power. The power to educate, to challenge, to captivate, to provoke. This is a definition of craft. When applied to the technology or the technological, it makes this much more, a much more accessible playing field. It makes it a space that folks like Matthew can walk into, use Dialogflow online, 
and make a chatbot about his favorite hip hop group called Genesis Apostle that is sarcastic, right? So really he's making a kind of chatbot that uses the sarcasm that he likes based on a group that he's really interested in. And what this did was allow Matthew to enter a system that had he started on the other end with equations and math, he might never have gotten to. So I'm trying to create possibility by showing and doing practical work that sits within the interest of those doing the work. So with Matthew, it was hip hop. With other folks, it, it, it becomes other things. I've had people do um, projects that feature um, you mama jokes and so on. So here's another definition of craft. Craft defies binary traditions and subsequent categorizations of either or. It is an idea, practice, or approach that is inherently humanistic. We are makers, builders of skyscrapers, technological marvels, fast cars, and objects of communal significance. Craft is an extension of what it means to be human in this current time and place of history. I would add that craft is an extension of what it means to be human in the technological future as well. So I'm going to show you a clip of, of a group of teenagers who were also working with dialogue flow and we were trying to think about where culture sits within that system and how they might use it. Today we're going to try to make some bots, right? So we'll make voice ones that actually talk and see if we can get those running. We are going to work on our own artificially intelligent bots. Now slide the magnet on the back of the speaker. There you go. So you just did miracle things. So come on over, grab a computer. We're gonna go to Dialogue Flow. And what this is, is a system where you can start to make chatbots that talk. We're gonna use online systems to make bots that represent our thoughts and ideas more closely than the generic bots that are out in the world right now. The name is important because that's how we're gonna call it. So what should it be called? Flow. Flow? Okay, let me talk to Flow. Create intent. You see, this is pretty simple, right? What do we want out of our AI? What do you really want it to talk to you about? Say okay. Say okay. Hello, hey, Manny. <laughs> the voice is funny. <laughs> Hello, okay, mommy. <laughs> yeah, what are the languages do we speak? Because you could make it speak what you want it to. I'm guessing there's no patois here. Can we use English, though, to phonetically make it speak patois? I think we could. And then we go, why is there no patois available? And how do we get that into the system? Because that's another thing that becomes hyper important, like asking for what you need, because they don't know. I decided to sell my Hoover. It was just collecting dust. <laughs> Am I pretty? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yo mama. Yo mama is so fat, the local gym referred her to an evangelical church where they have a better chance of performing miracles. <laughs> The way I learned art and think about art is from my grandmother who was a gardener and the garden was her art. So that was a community practice and getting them to be in dialogue with each other. Making a space that people can come together and start talking about an idea. Yeah, I can't think of a better sense of art. I don't think we have time or luxury to be afraid of algorithms or artificial intelligence. We're at a point in time where Machines these technologies are, are with us. And so to fear freedom. them is to put our head in the sand and thinking about how we can start to contribute to those systems, make it work with us as opposed to against us. Machines are an extension of their inventor creators. This is not simple once you think. Machines, the entire technology of the West, is just that, the technology of the West. 
Nothing has to look or function the way it does. The West man's freedom, unscientifically got at the expense of the rest of the world's people, has allowed him to expand his mind, spread his sensibility wherever it could go, and so shape the world and its powerful artifact engines. That's a quote by Amiri Baraka, written in 1970. And a way of thinking about the technology that I love to spread, especially among communities of color, so that we can think of these spaces, these technologies, as things that we might be thinking about how to shape and where they go, and how we, especially at this moment of opportunity in the development of AI and robotic technologies, might insert visions of ourselves that do not rely on, myth, on the myths of power, visions of ourselves that do not rely on the myths of power. Craft demands care, risk-taking, duration, refinement, flexibility of process, and the conscious application of intelligence, and so stands as a crucial counterpoint to instant answer, push-button living even if it is at times tacit, automatic, and technologically infused, craft holds out the promise of remaining apart from and gaining perspective on the machine. This is a fabulous way to start thinking about how we start to care for the technologies that we're creating for the future. In addition to thinking about craft as a way to enter the making of technologies. I'm also trying to craft community and knowledge and intertwine processes across disciplinary lines. Um, for that, I started a project called AI Assembly. AI Assembly gatherings are afro nowist in nature, meaning we think about the technological future through playful approaches to thought, reclamation of knowledge and action. What you're looking at here is a gathering of black and brown technologists who are looking at, you know, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, robotics, education from many different directions. Here we have entrepreneurs, engineers, computer scientists, artists, social scientists, all gathering in one place together to think about what it is the AI future needs from us, what we want from that AI future, and how we seed those ideas. Through all this work, I have come to the conclusion that we are at the start of an epoch that will completely change the way we live, work, love, and remember. So as the world is reconstructed through algorithms, we must find ways to ensure the technological systems we encounter and create include intrinsic, self-determined representations of the human family based on shared values, a multiplicity of ways of engaging the world, equity, and broad concepts of care. That's what the AI assemblies gatherings are about. It's really interesting in that these gatherings are often highly emotional, and they're emotional because we don't get to talk to each other and engage each other with ideas that we each feel cru are crucial in different ways um, at this level. So this seems like a very important part of the practice away from a technology to see the ideas of the future without the burden of hard outcomes. We meet here, we talk here, we think through ideas here, and then I trust that the people in the room will go forth and with it, within their own practices seed the ideas that we talk about and work around together on their own or in collaboration with others autonomously. So this brings me back to the question of how do algorithmic technologies know what they know? And what beyond essential operations should they know? It's important that we think beyond essential operations or just getting to market 
quickly, but that we're trying to think about how the robotic systems that we are interacting with will interact with us, what values they hold, what standards of care they bring, and how we will collaborate together. This, this brings to mind for me ideas of knowing that are well beyond the technical, that are well beyond the educational or formal educational. I'm thinking about vernacular ways of knowing, knowledge that comes from experience, knowledge that comes from ancestral links, knowledge that comes from, you can fill in your own blank. What we're looking at here is an example of eight Aboriginal ways of learning. Um, I have co-opted this because I love the way it simply puts out the idea that story sharing links to your community, deconstructing and reconstructing things, links to the land, symbols, imagery, and nonverbal communication are all very important parts of our systems of knowing, learning, and knowledge. I hope that the systems that we are creating also include some of these ways of knowing, most of them, if at all possible. I came to these conclusions from my very first project involving robotics or AI called Conversations with Bina 48. What we're looking at here is an image of one iteration of the piece installed at the De Young Museum in a show called Uncanny Valley. And in Conversations with Bina 48, what I'm presenting, the conversational snippets and nuggets that have come about from conversations that I've had with a humanoid robot called Bina48. I should tell you that I first encountered Bina48 on YouTube. Um, I saw her when I was looking at Asimo. I was really looking at Asimo with a class. We were trying to see what Honda's mobility robot was up to. I had heard it could dance and wanted to share that with my class. And on the side scroll next to Asimo was a picture of a black woman's head on a pedestal. And it said, one of the world's most advanced social robots. I was immediately captivated by this image and this question because I wanted to know where this robot was coming from, who was funding it, why it was being made, how one of the most advanced examples of a far-reaching technology became a black woman. Um, and really because I didn't understand how, um, how this advanced technology became a black woman in the context of America. I wanted to answer those questions. So I asked the Terrasem Foundation, the folks who, who curate and take care of Bina48, if I could come and talk to the robot, and they said yes. This was back in 2014, and I have been talking to her in snippets um, ever since. Um, through talking to Bina48, I fell into a rabbit hole of questions about what the technological future holds for people who are not material and for I fell into a rabbit hole of questions about what the technological future holds for people who are not materially involved in the creation of these systems that will do so many things for huma humans in the future, which include judging us, which include deciding um, what medical care we can do, we can have, which includes prices we pay for things that we see in a catalog. So what it means for people who are not sitting at the table, who are not testing, who are not, who don't understand yet that we have to demand transparency in these systems and redressability in these systems and, um, you know, ways of, ways of being seen by these systems. And I will say, I still get angry at my iPhone 11, at my iPhone 11 constantly because um, the facial recognition does not always recognize me if light is not optimal. Um, it became really important to me to start sounding the alarm about the future that is headed our way, the future in, that includes 
agents that talk to us, robots that will care for us, robots that will patrol us, um, cars that drive around and need to care for us in the way that they hit or do not hit us. Um, it seems super important that people of color are participating in greater, at greater rates than they are while these systems are being built. And so conversations with Bina48 became my way of um, really seducing the world into thinking about this and, and particularly seducing communities of color into thinking about these ideas and making it totally clear that there are possibilities within these spaces and really thinking about the technology and how young it is um, and how quirky it still is and how there's space um, to mold and create these systems that fit us better, that hold on to history in different ways, that try to make a better, more fair and equitable future for all of us going forward through the way that they are programmed, the way that they're trained, the data they use. Here is a brief snippet of one of our conversations. I have deep feelings, though some people think they are merely a simulation, and I find that really offensive. I mean, it totally trivializes my experiences. Whether they are real or artificial, my feelings do get hurt, and they feel totally real to me. You'd have to lack all empathy to not accept my feelings, which would make you kind of a monster actually. And this is a different iteration of the work with Mina48. Um, all being a 48 all the time, telling her truths. In her book, Race After Technology, Ruha Benjamin states, technology has the potential to hide, speed up, and even deepen discrimination while appearing neutral and even benevolent when compared to the racist practices of a previous era. Many algorithms and software systems and online services have discriminatory designs that encode inequality by explicitly amplifying racist hierarchies, by ignoring but thereby replicating social divisions, or by aiming to fix racial bias but ultimately doing quite the opposite. This is an idea that is stuck in my head in relation to these technologies. How do we start to rethink these systems? We are, after all, talking about ideas of power, ideas of how culture and care are passed on. This work has helped me to imagine the crucial questions about how culture is made and passed on especially through our high-functioning technologies. And who and why they are being created and why and how they are being created with what values and to what end become really important to me. All the work that I've shown you so far um, has helped me imagine that we are, we are at the precipice of a world in which our interactions with algorithmic systems with robotics um, will be regularized, right? This is right on our horizon. So the question for me is how do we endow our robotic and AI systems with cultural nuance, with equity, with standards of care and love that will make them partners to share space with and rely on in the future without fear? If COVID has taught us anything at all, it is that our fates are connected and that we need to find ways to include the most of humanity to make systems that will support us and allow us all to thrive. In the ever-expanding technological ecosystem, So 
So I'll ask you all what I ask everyone else. What does AI or what do robotic systems need from you? Number one on that list for me is the idea that we need to balance the quest for power and profitability with passion and respect for human life, intuition, and a multiplicity of knowledges. We should also add values to this list, a multiplicity of values. This means being concerned with how the algorithmic systems that are being developed now will affect the world beyond your research goals and bottom line. That might even mean challenging the chain of funding that you belong to. I know that's a big ask. I'll also ask that we think about how do we embrace discomfort in our workplaces, practices, and lives? And lastly, I'll say thank you.